Hey friends! Do you like Japan? Do you love it so much you're willing to defy expectations and migrate to the world class levels of office toxicity? Do you like battles? Do you like it when you see thousands upon thousands of dead human bodies? Look no further, control huge medieval armies, fight big battles, and live out your dream of becoming the ultimate Japanese warlord. I'm talking about Total War Shogun 2. Total War Shogun 2 is a strategic turn-based real-time war game set over the time where Japan is an absolute battle royale, chasing the price of becoming the Shogun, the biggest dick in Japanese society. But why? Why are they having such immense distress to begin with? Because top brass can't decide between putting a literal infant or peaceful monk to lead their armies of the rising sun. The tension rose, and they renovated the capital, then left prematurely. Now every honorable man felt compelled to the responsibility of rebuilding the once magnificent province. Shogun 2 is set many decades after that uh, awkward situation. Everyone's still a dick, life's still simple, and the average lifespan is about 20 years. Now, this is the time to unify Japan once again. Choose between 12 gentlemen to stabilize the realm. These include the Shimazu, Masters of the Blade, Honorable, Nature Lovers, and they got plenty of brothers. Josokabe, Masters of Medieval Miniguns and Agriculture. Hojo, Masters of Architecture and Recreating Modern Warfare. Mori, Masters of Sailing and Capturing Trade Notes. Oda, Masters of the Miracle of Multiplying Birth Rates. They excel at building thousands of farmers and creating human walls. Date, Masters of Suicide Charges. Takeda, Masters of Horses, Maneuverability and Micromanagement. Tokugawa, Masters of Bribery and Unifying Japan. Uesugi, Masters of Praying. Praying that they somehow survive the onslaught of unsolicited negative attention for some reason. Hattori, Masters of Subterfuge, Assassination and the Weirdest Unit Upgrade, Minimal Ammunition. Ikoiki, Masters of Religious Communism. They have farmers with better numbers. They have monks with guns. They have monks with horses. They can defend a whole province with just their three-tier temple. And finally, the Otomo, sell out to the Western Barbarians. Each of them has different situations but the goal is the same. Capture the capital and unify Japan. Amass a military might and fight your way through the multitudes of samurai armies. Shogun 2 has three islands, four if you count the Pesca one up north. In the beginning, you start as a humble clan with one or two provinces. But soon, you'll start expanding in the name of territorial expansion, religion, and impulsive behavior. Of course, this won't sit quite well with the other clans. Overcome such adversaries by recruiting a number of farmers, bodyguards, monks, and even the Portuguese, all while managing their upkeep and retaining their loyalty. You must also devise a composition to your armies. While it's completely possible to use Ashigaru Spearmen to your entire army, it's not really viable. You should diversify your units from commoners to samurai warriors to samurai cavalry to monks, further classifying them with different weapons, which could also be separated from melee weapons, bows, firearms, and artillery. But you know what, let's not complicate things. Melee and missile units are just enough. Cavalry gets cured by spearmen anyway, and you will counter missile units with your own. Of course, with higher difficulty, rules are quite different. The AI regularly consumes a healthy dose of steroids every day. Their women able to birth 10 times as fast, and their children growing to adulthood in just 4 months. But you can't win if you can't feed. Produce enough rice to feed and supply your people. Upgrade our farms and employ better agricultural strategies. There are many buildings you could make which you could also upgrade over the course of time. These upgrades are unlocked if you have the right technology and access to unique resources. 
resources that sometimes are only accessible by trading with foreigners. With the right circumstances, you could make a rice utopia or central trading hub and fatten your coffers, forever making your people big, healthy, and happy. Which means I can raise taxation and earn more money. But enough about spreadsheets and logistics. Let's talk about the actual gameplay. There are three types of battles. Land battles, naval battles, and siege battles. Land battles are the most common one as you'll be taking an opportunity to play within the surrounding landscape. Take advantage of hills, rivers, and <laughs> bridges, my favorite. Siege battles are just land battles with castles. Naval battles are about ships using directions and firing arrows to each other. It's quite clunky to be honest and it's a different playing field than land battles. Now, I'm going to walk through what it feels like to play the campaign. The Shimazu starts at the very west of the map. While at first it may look like a giant disadvantage seeing how far the capital is, but they're actually situated on the best island in the game. In fact, if your clan is placed along the western parts, you will actually have a better security both financially and militarily than the rest because you will gain three of the largest rice farms, gain unique resources, and secure at least four trade nodes. Shimazu already has a blacksmith and they specialize in katanas. So make a bunch of them and slice over the hordes of disposable commoners. The Chosokabe has almost the same strategy, secure their own island nation and proceed with either invading the center or Kyushu. They specialize in archers and the product of many porcupine jokes. And rightfully so because their archers can shred enemy units quickly, especially in sieges where they turn into a slow minigun, breaking units before they even scale the walls. Archers can also be useful in siege attacks too. If used correctly, they can potentially outrange the units inside and massacre them, saving you tons of units instead. The Otomo clan are the cowboys of medieval Japan. They specialize in guns and enforcing a new type of religion, Christianity, a religion associated with battling imperialism and oppression, which seems very attractive to the folks who spent the last century in constant warfare. The Otomo has fronted this type of innovation of Western ideas, whether it will be based on pure intentions or malevolent reasons. It is now a fact that they have access to superior weaponry, and they can now implement their peaceful ways by force, decimating any regiment regardless. The Mori specialize in ships, and that's it. They have the highest potential in securing the seas, and your boredom. Naval battles in Shogun 2 are just as dull as filling water to a bucket. You wait as they circle around each other and hope the other ship shatter first. Maybe you'll have your fun when you get those late gear cannon ships, or those foreign trade ships, or even capturing the black ship. But there's not much incentive in choosing these ship loving pirates. The Dati clan specialize in what we call the classic war cry for extreme nationalism. They don't care about their own lives. They only live for the sole purpose of charging the enemy and slaying every bit of resistance. They're just like the Shimazu who develop better calves because it takes at least three seasons to travel from one province to another. Eventually, they can grow so powerful that nothing can even stop them. Not an army three times bigger, not the combined forces of the rest of Japan, and not even the latest technology of the time can resist the mighty scourge of the clan with the bamboo leaves. The overall experience feels like Attack on Titan. The Hojo starts with a gold mine and a blacksmith. They like building castles and destroying castles. Canonically, they're placed in strategically one of the richest regions in the whole country. And they're probably the most fun you'll ever get if like bombarding thousands of people in an age where missile defense systems don't exist. The Takeda studies the art of cavalry. I have no idea what I'm doing. All I do is run around and try to maneuver my horsemen. Charge as many times as I want, then win. 
What better way to encapsulate the Takeda experience other than making people fly away from the sheer force of my ride? With the Takeda, no survivors are allowed or they will die trying to run. The Uesugi is such a hard plan to play. Everyone really hates you and you don't really get any advantage. It tested the limits of my capabilities by squeezing every tactical brain cells I ever had so far. Taking advantage of every terrain, every negotiation, every cheats available. But props, Kenshin. Kenshin is just a literal chat. What really helped during this campaign is the usage of monks. Uesugi monks are what I would call incredibly persuasive, to the point where they harness cult like levels of morale and loyalty. They can even inspire other provinces to uproot their current warlords, only for me to take over several turns later. If late game comes for the Uesugi, you can just stomp them through normal battle or auto resolve. Either way, these divine monks are too powerful for mere mortals. Their only weakness are flying arrows. The Tokugawa specializes in the art of money, buying the loyalty of shameful generals, converting enemy agents, and extorting our poor citizens. That's about it. You want to roleplay historically? Choose Tokugawa today. Speaking of history, the Hattori is supposed to be the vassals of the Tokugawa, but now they're their own clan. Most of their units can have the Hattori Kisho training, which means they can deploy almost anywhere in the map. Attack from the back, immediately bombard them of arrow fire, place ninjas and throw bombs. Lead the night attack, separate stacks of armies and eliminate them one by one. They'll never know what hit them, but the main advantage of Hattori are these individual ninjas. They have improved sensibilities on assassination, sabotage, and scouting. Until they don't, of course. <laughs> Mostly, they're useful for stopping whole armies and stranding them in the middle of winter. You can also summon a special creature by upgrading the ninja tower. That special creature is called a woman. A woman who dedicated her life to finishing human males. The Oda is the best plan in the entire game, simply because they can utilize better numbers, employ hundreds of thousands of disposable commoners, then proceed to overwhelm the enemy through sheer numbers by using simple tricks that involve human spear walls. Yes, all we have to do is lure our enemy to our massive barbecue party. And finally, the Iko Iki, the religious culmination of salvation opposed to the warring states. Their main goal is to depose the current system and replace it with their religious doctrines. They have better numbers, they have access to cheap swordsmen, they have masterless samurai, and they have monks capable of wielding different weapons and riding horses. Truly a ragtag team of misfits. Everyone hates them, and as far as I know, they're as fun as playing the Uizuki and the Tomo. Weirdly enough, it is the people with religious ties that everyone wants to eradicate. Diplomacy exists in the game, but not for long as even friendly clans will still end up betraying you sooner or later. The only good thing I was able to benefit greatly from diplomacy is by gaining money. Trade agreements are extremely common, but do you actually know your worth? Fortunately, in Shogun 2, you can just retry until you get the right price. Over the course of time, you will be famous and powerful. You go too powerful, and you will divide the realm between you and the rest of medieval Japan. And this is the most stressful and exciting time of every campaign in Shogun 2. Vassals and friends will betray you. Everyone's armies will be marching towards your domain. And worst of all are the annoying naval invasions. Good luck out there. How about multiplayer? I never played it because I have no time for the internet and its much desired elements. You can also play famous historical battles too that actually occurred in medieval Japan, believe it or not. Whether it be accurate or not is negligible. The one battle I can't forget is the naval one. 
Who knew that bringing bombs into a naval battle makes to a satisfying spectacle? Battles are magnificent in Shogun 2. You can utilize a variety of landscape to your advantage to undermine enemy units. You can block their line of sight, drain their energy, lure them to a narrow path, and many many more tactics involving weaponry, formations, and maneuvers. Really, it's just fun. Everything is completely great. The battles, the music, the atmosphere is just perfect. So, in the end, I give Total War Shogun to a score of 10 rebellions out of 10 attempts. Play it, enjoy it.